All right, let's work through this. So the first thing you need to do is factor it as prime factorization. Can you do that in your head quick? Did, what, what was it? Three squared times three cubed, four times 27. <clears throat> and then what I usually do is I start with the cyclic option here. So that would be Z sum 108. And that would be the only one that's going to be cyclic. What would be an alternative way to write that? Yeah, the external direct product of Z4 and Z27 would be an alternative way to write the cyclic group of order 108. Or the external direct product of Z27 and Z4. Those are distinct groups, but they're isomorphic to each other. Give me another option here. A, a distinct isomorphism class here. And oh, before we do, why can we say this? Why can we say these are isomorphic? Yeah, four and 27 are relatively prime. So what would be an example of another option that's not isomorphic to this first option? Z2, what else? Yep. And the distinction between this and this is that the external direct product of Z2 with itself is not isomorphic to Z4. So that will make these two things not isomorphic to each other. An alternative way to write that would be say Z2 external direct product with what? Z54. Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. What if you went back to having the first factor be Z4, what could I do with the Z27 to get another isomorphism class? A distinct one. Z3 and Z9. or the external direct product of Z3 with itself three times, three copies of Z3. How many more are there after this? How many am I, am I missing? Two of them. Essentially just take these two options and split the Z4 apart into Z2 external direct product with Z2. And those will be non-isomorphic options compared to these things. But you can keep the Z3 and the Z9 the same for the first one and the Z3 external direct product with Z3 and Z3 again for the second. So altogether six isomorphisms, isomorphism classes. You would say any abelian group of order 108 is isomorphic to one of these. Of course, the abelian group itself that you're, that you're looking at might not be actually literally one of these, right? Could be a U group, UN. And you're just trying to figure out which one of these it's isomorphic to by, as we talked about, looking at orders. Why are there six? It's related to the fact that, well, the number two has two ways to be partitioned as just two itself and one plus one. Those correspond to factoring four either as, or fact, factoring four either as um, itself, four to the first power, or two 
two squared. Let's see, I'm getting confused here. Well, there's two ways to partition two. With the number three, that's the power, the exponent of the three here. There are three ways to partition three. So altogether, you go ahead and you multiply these numbers of ways, two ways to partition two, three ways to partition three, and you get six total isomorphism classes like we talked about. This pattern does not continue. There are not four ways to partition four. How many ways are there to partition, partition four? There's one, here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. And one more, one plus one plus one plus one. There are five ways to partition four. So that pattern does not continue. Let's do the number of ways to partition five as well. That's just five itself, four plus one, three plus two, three plus one plus one. Don't do two plus three because you've already done it. The fact that three plus two equals two plus three means we don't count that as distinct. Two plus one plus one plus one, or one plus one plus one plus one plus one. And I think I'm missing one. Say it again. Yeah, two plus two plus one. Yep. There are seven ways to partition five. Okay. And that would mean, for example, that if your group had order, say, two to the fifth, Abelian groups of order two to the fifth. Thirty-two. That there would be up to isomorphism seven of them. We could talk about the cyclic objects option Z thirty-two. Z sub two to the fifth. We could talk about the external direct product of Z two and Z sixteen. which is the same as the external direct product of Z2 and Z sub two to the fourth. This option corresponds to that first partition of five. This option corresponds to that second one. What would correspond to this third one? Z sub two cubed, eight. External direct product with Z sub two squared, four. That corresponds to this one. The one that would correspond to this next one would be the external direct product Z8 with Z2 with Z2. Eight being two cubed, two and two, each being two to the first. The option that would correspond to this one would be the external direct product of Z4 with Z2 with that Z2 occurring three times, corresponding to the fact that we've got three ones there. This option would have five copies of Z2. And this last option would have two copies of Z4, two squared, and one copy of Z2. So altogether, there are seven 
abelian groups up to isomorphism of order 32, two to the fifth. Likewise, there would be seven abelian groups of order three to the fifth, 243. There'd be seven abelian groups of order five to the fifth, seven to the fifth, 11 to the fifth, any prime to the fifth power, you're gonna have seven abelian groups up to isomorphism of that order. As we've talked about as well, the ways you could prove these are all distinct include counting the number of elements of the various orders. We know that isomorphisms preserve, preserve orders of elements. What if we had, I'm not gonna write them all down, but what if our group G had order, well, how about two to the fifth times three to the fifth? Whatever that turns out to be. Well, let's go ahead and figure it out for fun. Two to the fifth is 32. Three to the fifth is 243. This is order 7,776. How many abelian groups of order 7,776 would there be? Yeah, seven times seven. There are seven times seven. 49 abelian groups of this order. Okay, so there's nothing left to do in abstract algebra in terms of classing, classifying finite abelian groups. The fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups completely classifies them. Nothing left to, nothing, nothing left to research, it's all been done. So the only interesting thing left to do with abstract algebra and there is still plenty left to do with finite group theory is with the non-abelian case. Okay, and there's still plenty left to do on that. All right, I think that's our last main thing to do in group theory. We're gonna now move into chapter 12, which gets into rings and fields, the other main algebraic structures for this class, which remember used to be called al abstract uh, algebraic structures, but we changed it to the more generic name of abstract algebra again, because that looks better on transcripts. Groups, rings, and fields are all examples of algebraic structures. I'm not gonna write down the definition of a ring, what I'd like to do in class, the, the definition is in the lecture that, to watch online. What I'd like to do instead is for us to think about examples together and to try to see if we can abstract, possibly, by noticing patterns, the definition of a ring by considering examples. So yeah, don't, don't look in your book, actually. Don't look at chapter 12. We're going to see if we can try to pretend that we're the first people to try to come up with the definition of a ring by considering examples. So let's start with our one of our most simple examples, Z. As a set, that's the integers. It's German for Zahlen. That's where the Z comes from. Zahlen, spelled starting with the Z. What do we already know about this? We know it's an abelian group under addition. Let's just write down what we know. This is an abelian group. Under addition. So going back to the first week of class, what does that mean? List off some properties of that based on that fact there. What makes an, ab an abelian group under addition? What's the first most fundamental property? Starts with a C. And I don't mean commutative. It's closed. Closure. Which again, remember in our book, is not typically stated with the word closure, but the author says there's a binary operation. Addition is a binary operation. And when the author says that, he means it's closed. Second property. It's 
starts with an A. Associative property, third property. What do we usually call E? What do we call that? Identity, and what's the identity here? Zero. Fourth property, inverses. What's the, and they're additive inverses. So the additive inverse of four is negative four. The additive inverse of negative four is positive four. Yeah. And it is abelian, it is commutative as well. But hey, should I write but hey? But hey, we can multiply integers as well, right? And it's closed under multiplication. Z is also closed under multiplication. Multiplication is a binary operation. Remember technically what that means? Not that we ever really use this much, but technically what that means is that multiplication is really a function. I'll go ahead and use function notation with the arrows. I'll put a colon here. The, that dot is the function name, dot. That colon says, okay, to the right is gonna be the domain, which is the Cartesian product of Z with itself to itself, right? Dot is a function from the Cartesian product of Z with itself to itself. It maps an arbitrary ordered pair, AB, to their product, A times B. I know the, the cross notation here, the Cartesian product notation is inconsistent with the book's external direct product notation with the plus and the O around it. This is actually a more general kind of notation, it just applies to sets in general, you can form the Cartesian product. So that's technically what we mean when we say it's a binary operation. It takes two things and combines them to give you one thing, binary operation. And that one thing is automatically by our, our author's definition, at least in the set itself. And that implies closure. So it's closed under multiplication. Is it, is it associative under multiplication? Yeah, we know that, right? It's associative. And just like in the abstract group theory, we don't typically put a dot for multiplication. We won't here either. We'll put just use juxtaposition, just put the symbols next to each other. A times B in parentheses. A times B in parentheses times C is the same as A times BC in parentheses. Remember what parentheses mean. It's order of operations. This would mean do A times B first, then multiply by C. On the right, this would mean do B times C first, then multiply by A on the left. This distinction between left and right, though, doesn't really matter, right, with integer multiplication, because it's also commutative. It's also commutative. A times B does equal B times A. We know these things. We're not going to try to reprove that from scratch. These examples, we essentially take their properties as axioms. Does it have an identity? Zero? One, yeah. It's got an identity under multiplication. One times A equals A times one equals A for all integers A. Oh, it must be a group under multiplication. Or not? Is it a group? Go ahead and expand on that thought. Yeah. Not every element has a multiplicative inverse. Only two elements do, actually, even though it's an infinite set. 
Only one and negative one have multiplicative inverses. One is its own multiplicative, inver multiplicative inverse, and negative one is its own multiplicative inverse. It's a big star, but only plus or minus one have multiplicative inverses. <clears throat> but you know, we're almost there. We're almost to the group properties. We're only missing multiplicative inverses. Maybe we should still count this as a good algebraic structure anyway, under multiplication. It is a group under addition, not quite under multiplication, but it's, it's a very natural algebraic structure that we, of course, want to work with. We want to work with the integers. So maybe the fact that it, not everything has a multiplicative inverse is acceptable. And we can still call this an algebraic structure. And it is an example of a ring. This is an example of a ring. I'm not defining ring yet. I'm just saying this is an example of a ring. Not specifying quite yet what a ring is. Hmm. What else? What, what's another kind of example we could consider? Maybe we want to consider subgroups of this. Subgroups of this. This is a cyclic group. As a group, it's generated by plus or minus one. An example of a subgroup of this would be the cyclic group subgroup generated by, for example, two, which would also be generated by negative two which would be all the even numbers. Another cyclic subgroup would be generated by three or negative three, which would be all the multiples of three, et cetera. Let's focus on the even numbers. I could try to use cyclic group notation here, put a two inside pointed brackets. I think it's probably best to avoid that though and write this notation as shorthand notation for the even integers, two times z. That's certainly as a group under addition, it's a subgroup of the integers with zero as the identity and everything's got an additive inverse. And well, first of all, we definitely have closure you add any even integers, you get another even integer. Do we want to consider this to be a ring? Well, if we do, you might say it's a more deficient ring than Z is. And what do you think I would mean by that? Well, how is it deficient? I said this was a ring under multiplication. If I decide I want to want to let it be a ring under multiplication might be a better way to say that. You can make choices in this kind of stuff. <clears throat> How is it deficient compared to just Z itself? Go ahead, Nick. Uh, there's no identity. Yeah, under multiplication, there's no identity. One is not in it. And any other element doesn't doesn't serve as a identity under multiplication. So if I do decide I want to call this a ring, it doesn't have an identity. Should I then call this a ring? <clears throat> it turns out that that choice is made. We still call this a ring. This no longer has a multiplicative identity but we still decide to say it's a ring we still choose to call it a ring 
So rings don't have to have multiplicative identities. They do have to have a multiplication, but they don't have to, we decide, they don't have to have a multiplicative identity. Same with 3z, all integer multiples of 3. Same with 4z, same with 5z. Those would all be rings without identity. We will come back to thinking about integers modulo n. But before we do that, I think it might be helpful to think about one other property that rings do not have to have. Let's consider as a set, the set of all two by two matrices. A, B, C, D. And there's various choices you can make about what the entries A, B, C, and D are in as a set. We could take them to be real numbers. That, that's not the book's example in, in a, of a matrix ring. Their initial example, they take A, B, C, and D actually to be integers. But just to be a little different than the book, Let's take them to be real numbers. Under what operations? Well, remember the our main example of, of matrix group was two by two matrices where the determinant was non-zero under multiplication. That was called GL2 and then comma R if the entries were from the real numbers or comma Z if there were integers. Well. We couldn't actually take integers in that case because the inverse matrices were not necessarily going to have integer entries. But we could take Z sub 7, for example, and do multiplication mod 7, for example. But here, I'm not specifying that the determinant has to be non-zero. And I need two operations if it's going to be a ring. The two operations are matrix addition and matrix multiplication. So technically, I should use a different symbol for what this is. I shouldn't call it GL. And I believe our book's notation is M sub 2 of R. If you've got real entries, you do M sub 2 of Z with integer entries, for example. M kind of stands for matrix. Two stands for the fact that it's two by two. R stands for the fact that the entries are real numbers. And I'm not saying the determinant has to be non-zero. Addition is defined component-wise or entry-wise, you might say. A, B, C, D plus E, F, G, H. Do it entry by entry. It is an abelian group under addition. And in fact, if you think about it, the fact that we're putting this in a two, the matrices entries in a two by two array and doing the operation component wise, this is really, really not different than as a, a group under addition, the external direct product of R with itself with four copies of R. where your elements would be ordered quadruplets. What would be the isomorphism between them? If you take an arbitrary element, an arbitrarily arbitrary quadruplet, you'd map it to that matrix. It's obviously one to one and on to. Is it operation preserving? Well, since we're doing component-wise addition, it would be operation preserving. The operation here I'm talking about is addition. It would be an isomorphism. Whether you write the numbers as a quadruplet 
a row vector, if you prefer, or a column vector, or as a two by two matrix is just, what's the word I'm looking for? Window dressing or just a choice. It really doesn't affect the algebraic structure of it. However, with matrices, we know we also have multiplication of matrices, which is a non-obvious kind of operation, right? The way we multiply matrices, the way we do it is kind of funny when you think about it. We don't multiply component-wise, right? We do it with the dot product, dot product of rows here with columns here, AE plus BG, AF plus BH, CE plus DG, CF plus DH. So the fact that multiplication is done in that funny way means there's more going on here than meets the eye. It doesn't compare with this, this example in terms of a ring, in terms of multiplication. <clears throat> These are not isomorphic under multiplication. Why do we multiply matrices in this way? That's what you learned about linear algebra. I always justify it by saying you want to do this kind of multiplication because you want to think of matrices as defining linear transformations. And you want matrix multiplication to correspond to the composition of linear transformations. And if you work through the details of that, that means you have to multiply matrices this way. But again, I'm not saying the determinant is non-zero. So these matrices, I could be multiplying matrices that are not invertible. And I guess we're saying that's okay. It's still gonna be a ring. There is, an, there is a multiplicative inverse, right? The identity matrix, I sub two say, one zero zero one is a multiplicative identity, but certainly not every matrix has a multiplicative inverse. Only those with a non-zero determinant do. How else is this ring deficient compared to, say, Z? What other property does Z have that this matrix ring does not? under multiplication I'm talking about here. Which of these does it not have? Certainly matrix multiplication is associated. You learn that in linear algebra. It's not commutative, right? That should be a big lesson you learn in linear algebra as well. Matrix multiplication is not commutative. You just come up with you, pretty much two arbitrary uh, matrices that you pick. If you pick them somewhat randomly, they won't commute under multiplication. You've seen examples before. So while this is a ring and while it's got an identity, it does not, it's not the case that every matrix has a multiplicative, in, multiplicative inverse. And it's also not the case that it's commutative under multiplication. It is commutative under addition, but not multiplication. But this is, you would think, an important kind of example to consider. So we still want to call this a ring. Multiplication is not commutative. But we still want to call this a ring. We still choose to call it a ring. There are choices to make when you're constructing an abstract math theory, an axiomatic system. <clears throat> there are lots and lots of examples. You'll find more in the book. Let me talk about one more example, then we'll think about the definition.
let's consider the set Z6. We know this is a group under addition, mod six, an abelian group, in fact, under addition, mod six. We know this is an abelian group. Under plus mod six. We also know we can multiply these numbers mod six and we still will get a number in this list. So the multiplication is a binary operation. Multiplication mod six is a binary operation on the set. Multiplication mod six. is a binary operation. It's not isomorphic to U6, right? U6 set of positive integers relatively prime to six under multiplication mod six consists of just two elements, right? One and five. Under multiplication mod six is a group. It's isomorphic to pack to Z2, but the operation is multiplication mod six. That's a group, but this is not the same set as that. They're different sets. But multiplication mod six would still be a binary operation. It would still be closed. Four times three, for example, would be 12. 12 mod six is zero. Hmm, four times three is zero. Four times four is 16. Mod six would be four. Four times four is itself. Weird. Let's go ahead and make the full multiplication table. Um, I think we can do it pretty quickly. This is a multiplication mod six table, so it's not going to be a Cayley table. This is this is not going to be a group under multiplication. but we can still make a multiplication table. Zero times anything is zero. Hey, that kind of thing doesn't occur in a group's Cayley table, right? You never get a row or column where everything is the same. But this is going to be a ring, if that wasn't clear already because it's closed under multiplication and because multiplication will be associative. One does act as an identity, it seems. One times anything is itself. One times two is two. Let's multiply two by everything else and mod by six. Two times two is four. Mod six is still four. Two times three is six. Mod six is zero. It's not a group under multiplication mod six, but it's still a binary operation. Two times four is eight, mod six is two. Two times five is 10, mod six is four. You get repeated elements. Three times two is six, mod zero. Three times three is nine, mod six is three. Three times four is 12, mod six is zero. Three times five is 15, mod six is three. I can quickly fill in these things too. It is commutative under multiplication. Four times three, 12 mod six is zero. 
then four, then two, two there. No, excuse me, three here. Two there, five times five is 25, mod six is one. Interesting. One only occurs in this table in two spots. One is acting as a multiplicative identity. But wait a minute. Four is actually acting like a multiplicative identity as well to some degree. Four times two is two. Uh, so there are two, there are two multiplicative identities. Well, four times anything is not necessarily the anything. Four times three is not three. So four is almost more like a, a partial identity or something. But it is a binary operation and it is associative and it does have an identity that one that you multiply times anything you get that anything. So we still do want to call this a ring. Under addition mod six and under multiplication mod six, the two operations. In spite of these oddities. or maybe I should say curiosities, because this has nothing to do with odd numbers. Uh, we still want to call this a ring. We still choose to say Z6 is a ring, where your two operations are addition mod six and multiplication mod six. So evidently what this is saying is, is weird things can happen in rings. You can multiply two non-zero things and get zero. You can have a partial identity. Four times two is two, but four times three is not three. Some elements have multiplicative inverses, some don't. In fact, exactly the elements of U6 are the ones that have multiplicative inverses, one and five. One times one is itself, one is its own multiplicative inverse. Five times five is one. Five is its own multiplicative inverse. But zero, two, three, and four do not have multiplicative inverses. You cannot multiply zero, two, three, or four by anything and get one. By the way, weird things happen with in the ring of matrices as well. This one, you can square a non-zero matrix and get zero. Did you know that? If you take this matrix as one example and square it, you can go ahead and check it out. You'll get the zero matrix. A weird thing that would never happen if it were a group under multiplication. Of course, notice, notice this matrix has an, a determinant of zero, so it does not have an inverse. It's part of the reason you might say why this is not a contradiction. So what is the definition of a ring? I'm not going to peek at the book. We're not going to try to, I did not sit down and memorize the definition on my own. I'm going from memory here based on examples, mostly, and the examples that we've just done, especially. A non-empty set R is a ring if there are two binary operations defined on R. In the abstract, we call them addition and multiplication, and we write plus and dot. Or with multiplication, usually we just juxtapose. We don't bother writing the dot. In general, you might say they wouldn't have to be addition and multiplication in the usual sense. 
But to tell you the truth, in almost every example I can think of, it's addition and multiplication. And in, in some sense that you are used to, we are basing the abstraction off of examples, examples that share commonalities. There's a, an addition that makes sense and there's a multiplication that makes sense. By saying binary operations, we are saying they're cloaked. Yeah. You add two elements of the ring, you get another element of the ring. You multiply two elements of the ring, you get another element of the ring. That's what our author means by closure, is just saying they're binary operations. Addition and multiplication. Such that what properties hold? You can summarize the additive properties <clears throat> by just saying in one sentence, the ring is an abelian group under addition. R is an abelian group. Under addition. That summarizes a bunch of properties. I already mentioned the binary operation. It also says addition is associative. It also says there is an identity. We call the identity zero because it's under addition. We do not call it E anymore. But that zero could be the zero matrix in a matrix room. And every element has an additive inverse. The additive inverse of A is written negative A, not A to the negative one power, because it's an abelian group under addition. Do we really want the group to be a billion under addition? Um, that is part of the definition. You could say, well, maybe I wouldn't need to require that. But evidently, the examples are such that they always turn out to be a billion under addition. Could the group operation be function composition? We know function composition is not commutative. No, evidently, it can't be. Second property, we don't require there to be an identity under multiplication. We don't require a one, take the even integers, for example, no multiplicative identity, but we do require the associative property under multiplication. A, B, C equals A, B, C, like that, for all ring elements A, B, C, and R. You know this scratch, that's a scratch out there. <clears throat> but we're not assuming the multiplication is commutative. because the example with matrices is not, and we want that to be a ring. If the multiplication does satisfy the commutative property, we call it a commutative ring. We don't call it an ability ring. Sorry, Abel, you only get credit for groups, abelian groups. We call it a commutative ring, not an abelian ring. The addition is always commutative, it is an abelian group under addition. Multiplication is not necessarily commutative, mostly because we want rings of matrices to be rings. But if it is commutative, we don't call it an, an abelian ring. We call it a commutative ring. Is there a third property? Yeah, and it's actually one I haven't mentioned yet. 
I haven't mentioned the entire class unless I just happen to mention it and I don't remember. You learn back maybe in seventh, eighth, ninth grade about that's when you maybe first heard about commutative property, associative property. There's one other property, word starts with D, that we've hardly ever mentioned in this class. If I have, it's just sort of been as an aside note. Distributive property. We don't think about the distributive property in group theory, but we do in ring theory. Multiplication distributes over addition. A times B plus C is A times B plus A times C for all the ring elements A, B, C, and R. And we really should say something else. B plus C with the A on the right, right multiplication also distributes, but as B times A plus B times uh, C times A, excuse me, B times A plus C times A. But because the ring is not necessarily commutative, these are two distinct properties. And that does it. See how we compare with the book here. Okay, the author lists out the properties. In my property one is listed as a bunch of properties. Addition is a commutative, so it's an abelian group under addition. It's associative, there's an additive identity. Each element has an additive inverse. There's the associative property of multiplication. There's the two distributive properties of multiplication over addition. But some rings, yeah, some rings are commutative and some are not. And some rings do have a, a multiplicative identity, and some do not. When the ring has a multiplicative identity, it's just an extra assumption to make in whatever theorem you might be trying to prove. Assume the ring has a multiplicative identity. That might be a useful assumption. When it does have a multiplicative identity in the theory, we, we do symbolize it by the number one. A ring with multiplicative identity I should say in a ring with multiplicative identity. The multiplicative identity is denoted by the number one in the abstract. But realize that that's not necessarily the true number one. That could be the identity matrix, for example. Or, as another example, you'll see in chapter 12, you can have rings whose elements are functions. Well, like, for example, polynomials. That could, that could be the, the constant polynomial, P of X always equals one. There are polynomial rings. And in fact, polynomial rings are going to be our most important rings, actually. As we come near the end of the course, we're going to be talking a lot about polynomials. How are polynomials rings? Well, you can add polynomials and you can multiply them. And it's closed under addition and multiplication. And these other properties are satisfied. It's a billion under addition. It's also commutative under multiplication. Doesn't matter what order you multiply two polynomials, right? And associative under multiplication does work. That takes some verification. That's maybe not super easy to verify if A, B, and C are polynomials. That would probably take a lot of work in the abstract to verify that, but it is true. And the distributive property does work. And there is an identity. 
the constant polynomial p of x always equals one. As a function that you can graph, its graph is a horizontal line at, at one. So this doesn't truly have to be the number one. Or we still in the abstract write a one. Instead, we could write an e, but since in examples it tends to be some form of one, we call it one in the abstract theory. And we call this, yeah, it is the multiplicative identity, but we also give another name to it. We call it the unity of the ring. Unity of the ring. That's the more common name to use, actually. Instead of saying multiplicative identity, it's quicker to say unity. Unity means multiplicative ident identity. Not every element has a multiplicative inverse, even if the ring does have a multiplicative identity, like Z. One, the number one is a multiplicative identity, but certainly only plus or minus one are the only two elements that have multiplicative inverses. Elements that do have multiplicative inver inverses, for example, in this ring, one and five are the two elements that have multiplicative inverses, also have a special name. They're called units. If a lot of paper here and we're almost out of time. If A in R has a multiplicative identity, or a multiplicative inverse, I should say. If A in R has a multiplicative inverse, we call A. That's the element of A, element A, not the, not the word A. <laughs> we call A, A unit. Should probably use a different letter than A there, but. Unity stands for a multiplicative identity. Unit means it's an element that has a multiplicative inverse. Would zero ever have a multiplicative inverse? It certainly doesn't in the integers. It certainly doesn't even in the real numbers. Every non-zero real number has a multiplicative inverse when you consider the real numbers to be a ring under addition and multiplication. Every non-zero real number is a unit, but zero is not. There is only one exception to the real numbers being a group under multiplication. The number zero is just the one exception. That's the only thing that doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. That's the only thing that's not a unit in the real numbers or the rational numbers for that matter. Yeah, it takes proof, but zero will never have a multiplicative inverse. Whatever, you, whatever the zero is in your ring, whether it's the number zero or the matrix zero, the zero matrix, or the zero polynomial, it will never have a multiplicative inverses. So what that means is rings are never ever groups under multiplication. But, last thing to say today, but there is a special class of rings, like the real numbers, for example, where the non-zero elements form a group under multiplication. The non-zero real numbers form a group under multiplication. In fact, we even mentioned that the first few weeks of class. I think I called it R star. When your ring is also an abelian group under multiplication, when you take out zero, I mean, it's got a special name, it's called a field. And when you talk about algebraic structures, the main three things people typically say are groups, rings, and fields. But fields are just special examples of rings, very special rings where every property you would want to hold does hold. Okay. All right. Have a good weekend.